Tony Kinnett. 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 Host of the Tony Kinnett cast. Let's get down to business. You're listening to the Tony Kinnett cast on 93 WIPC. Here on the Daily Six. Hey, hey, thank you very much for joining us this evening. This is the Tony Kinnett cast over at 93 WIBC from Indianapolis, from 1250 over in Little Rock, also on the air in Denver, in Milwaukee, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, the Panhandle of Florida. It's great to share. We're expanding with more syndication partners around the country, all of the syndicated through the Daily Signal. It's been a long week. I know that uh, some of the live shows have come in kind of some different times. There's been a lot going on with the presidential debate Monday in Nashville, Tuesday night, Five hours of debate coverage, the pregame, the game itself, and then the post coverage. What a blast. What an absolute mess. And that now brings us to the overkamala fidence, the overconfidence of our dear vice president and her entire campaign. Boy, oh boy, ladies and gentlemen, what an experience. We said at the outset of her campaign that it seemed a lot like a sugar rush. Because Kamala Harris didn't actually provide anything that was brand new, something exciting. She just seemed to say that she was better than Biden, you know, I I guess, even though there wasn't actually any idea as to what her policies were or weren't or how she was the same or different than the guy that was unscrupulously stabbed right before she ended up taking the position. And uh, then she had her long-awaited debate with Donald Trump. And it, it, the first couple of uh, minutes after the debate, I looked at my uh, co-moderators of the show, I looked at Bradley Devlin, looked over at Tyler O'Neill, and I said, guys, I think that was a rough, rough debate. But I'm going to put a little bit of a pin in it because the further you get out from a debate, the real effects, the real consequences, the real results start to come in and they come in pretty danged hard. And that is what has happened. The Kamala Harris, Tim Walls campaign has walked away thinking that because Kamala outperformed Trump in the debate by capitalizing on Trump's rough moments, baiting Trump and working with the moderators to get Trump to defend a lot of stupid nonsense, that somehow that's a victory for her. Only that wasn't Kamala Harris goal going into the debate, at least not for the American voter. What the American voter wanted was to know what she believed, what she plans to do and how she's different than either 2019 Kamala super extremely progressive, super Bernie liberal, or Biden, who is the weird old dead guy who just kind of goes where the wind blows. So which is she? Well, she didn't answer that question. And this brings us to how Kamala's campaign is in serious trouble after Tuesday. Because if Kamala, you know, certainly didn't lose the debate to Donald Trump, you know, if, it, if at best it was, you know, some kind of a functional draw, then Why is the campaign in serious trouble? Well, this basically boils down to two primary reasons. Number one, no one is really watching the debate like a traditional debate from start to finish anymore. By that, I mean fewer people are actually tuning into the debate. 10 or 20 million fewer people tuned into this debate than did uh, the debate with uh, Obama and Romney, then with Trump and Hillary, even then Trump and Biden. People aren't tuning in as much, which means that where are people getting their debate stuff? Well, they're actually getting their debate stuff from clips that are posted to social media. That changes everything about the debate because you're not actually getting all of the quiet, awkward moments and all of the ramblings going on unless you're really deep into one side's echo chamber. What you're getting are the really punchy points which means that the line that Trump used at the tail end, which was that, hey, you've been the vice president for the last couple of years. You know, why haven't you? Well, you know what? I'm I'm not even going to dig into this. Here is the social media clip of Trump's very last statement uh, on Kamala Harris. So she just started by saying she's going to do this. She's going to do that. She's going to do all these wonderful things. Why hasn't she done it? She's been there for three and a half years. They've had three and a half years to fix the border. They've had three and a half years to create jobs and all the things we talked about. Why hasn't she done it? She should leave right now, go down to that beautiful White House, go to the Capitol, get everyone together and do the things you want to do. But you haven't done it. And that's what's been clipped and shown all over social media. Now, Trump should have led with that, but 
just looking at social media clips, no one really knows Trump started out rambling and then spent kind of the evening being chased around on the fish hook. Nobody's aware of that. There have been clips shown of the moderators being really aggressive and not at all moderator like towards Trump and really friendly butt kissing towards Kamala Harris. Uh, Also, the social media clips going around have been Kamala getting her I'm speaking moment at former Vice President Mike Pence back during the vice presidential debate. Well, let's get so I, but no, but Susan, I, this is important. Susan, I, I, and I, I want to add, but if, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. I have to I'm speaking. In. I'm speaking. I'm speaking. I'm speaking. And then Trump actually roundhouse clocked her with this during this debate, which was honestly pretty funny. Please. In Minnesota, she went out. Wait a minute. I'm talking now. If you don't mind, please. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> By the way, I should point out that on TikTok, the clip, both of these clips posted by ABC News, right? The Trump conclusion clip got 23.3 million views. The Kamala Harris conclusion clip, 4.4 million. The modern social media landscape has completely changed how debates work. And by the way, the same way that conventions work, because now the debate's not really the first time that you see candidates square off. They spend the entire election with media, with social media squaring off against each other. Just like the conventions now, the entire campaign is the convention. It's both parties fawning over the candidate the entire race. So that's why we're seeing the conventions and the debates have kind of a minimal effect unless everything just completely goes to crap. Now, that brings us to Trump's talking about uh, eating the dogs, you know, the reading the cats and the geese by Haitian migrants in Springfield, Ohio. And Kamala Harris seized on this by getting her cocky smile going, he's insane. And everyone memed Trump saving dogs and kittens with AI generated photos and such. And the left kind of chuckled to themselves for about 3.8 seconds and thought, ah, we got him to say something really stupid. Look how stupid he is, because, you know, Trump was up there basically talking about a meme to express very serious concerns about Haitian migrants in Springfield, Ohio. So the entire country is now looking at the insanity of illegal immigration. This is Kamala Harris' worst nightmare. In getting so overconfident, like Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton, levels of overconfident, thinking that, oh man, after Trump rambled on and mentioned a meme about dogs and cats and became a meme himself, then all of a sudden he was licked. Oh, we got him. We got him dead to rights, boys and gals. Uh, Then they started running around doing some stupid stuff. Two bad things happened immediately. Number one, the entire country said, hmm, what's going on in old Springfield, Ohio? And after the night of the debate, immediately after the night of the debate, I texted Adam Wren from Politico and I asked, hey, Adam, are you still good to come on the show after the debate? The debate kind of went in a very weird way. Not as many commercial breaks as we were expecting. Guests kind of move around when you have a five hour show. Things get a little fluid. And so he shot me back a text and he said, no, but I'm more than happy to hop on and do an interview later this week from Springfield, Ohio. And at that moment, I knew, aha. Because Trump got up in front of the country and because Trump pointed out the meme, maybe true that dogs and cats were getting cut up, whatever, maybe not. Maybe it was just geese. But because Trump said that bombastic thing on the air, the entire country said, hmm, what is going on in Springfield? And the media are currently descending. Now, Libby Emmons, who runs the Post Millennial, who Andy No is from, uh, and I chatted just a little bit about the rumors that were starting to come out about this on Monday night. She was also at the Daily Wire's Am I Racist premiere. And we talked a little bit about sending someone down there. The media outlets are converging. And what did you find? Well, that a town of 60,000 people, 60,000 people, which is about the population, at least what used to be of Springfield, Ohio, was hit with 20,000 illegal migrants from Haiti, settled there by the government, who were then given travel vouchers to stay in housing there which the homeless people in that particular town don't even get access to. You know, the homeless problem. I don't know of a single homeless Haitian in this town because they all got vouchers. But I can show you a whole bunch of people that have been displaced because I'm that guy. Rob, you know, for 25 years, I've worked with the homeless in this community. This brings us to the second serious issue of overconfidence. No one is comfortable just taking a victory and like calling it a day. Like throughout world history, no one has is considered maybe we sit back and relax and it usually results in the fall of an empire. In this particular case, 
Kamala decided, you know what? Sure, Kamala wasn't able to do an interview before. Sure, everyone was really terrified of the debate. Sure, Kamala wasn't really able to do anything on her own at all, point blank. Since back in her beginning of politics, when there were weird videos circulating around that uh, Willie Brown had her on her on his arm back in the 90s. She was just as brainless then as she is now. Oh, you know what? Maybe maybe all of that has just changed because she had one good night against Trump in the debate in which both of the moderators were on her side. Certainly that has cured her of all problems that has forgiven all sins. So they get an interview scheduled with MSNBC, maybe George Stephanopoulos, maybe uh, the Joe Scarborough crew. Huh? huh? Some, get, get your leftists out there from various... No, no, no. Hold a local interview with ABC6. And things just absolutely caught on fire. Went down in flames. So first of all, he asked her about what her plans were to bring down prices. Now look, you knew where this was going. I know where this was going. Kamala cannot talk off script. She's never been able to. She had to take days to memorize what she could about the debate before she went into it. Suddenly she thinks she can do TV interviews. This is like me popping in for a segment on a radio show and then deciding the next day that I deserve my own eight hour a day radio and television program. That, that, that's quite the jump. So here's Kamala Harris answering sort of vaguely, almost the question of what she plans to do to bring down the inflationary prices that she helped cause. When we talk about bringing down prices and making life more affordable for people, yeah. what are one or two specific things you have in mind for that? Well, I'll start with this. Um, I grew up a middle class kid. My mother raised my sister and me. She worked very hard. Um, she was able to finally save up enough money to buy our first house when I was a teenager. Um, I grew up in a community of hardworking people, you know, construction workers and nurses and teachers. And I try to explain to some people who may not have had the same experience, you know, if, if but a lot of people will relate to this. You know, I grew up in a neighborhood of folks who were very proud of their lawn, you know. And, um, and I was raised to believe and to know that all people deserve dignity. And that we as Americans have a beautiful character. You guys do remember the question was, and I quote, what are you going to do to bring down prices? And Kamala is talking about, I was raised to believe and to know and to do and to see. And uh, there's a scene in Friends, the 90s sitcom, in which Joey has been asked to be the officiant for Chandler and Monica's wedding. And when he's practicing like his speech is at the beginning, you know, he wants like, you know, the dearly beloved Joey writes his own and he gets stuck on the same words. He says this love that we have and we give and we give and receive that is full of having and receiving and giving and having. That's just Kamala Harris word salad. Didn't answer the question at all. By the way, did the same thing during the debate. You think people don't notice that? They notice. Lights are on. Nobody's home. Screen door in her submarine. May look really good. Water's still coming through, boys and girls. And it got worse because then he asked her, how, you know, are you different, perhaps, than Joe Biden? And Kamala kind of repeats herself, and then it just falls apart even worse than the last one, if you can imagine that. Check it out. I wonder if there are one or two spots, policy areas or approaches, where you would say, I'm a different person. Well, I'm obviously not Joe Biden. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I offer a new generation of leadership. And so, for example, thinking about developing and, and creating an opportunity economy where it's about investing in areas that really need a lot of work and maybe focusing on again the aspirations and the dreams but also just recognizing that at this moment in time some of the stuff we could take for granted years ago we can't take for granted anymore um, for example another um, plan that I have that is a new approach is to expand the child tax credit to six thousand dollars for young families for the first year of their child's life I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this very clearly. The question was, in one or two areas, he even like framed it up for really nice. 
Maybe just one or two, maybe just like a policy, maybe a thought. Maybe sometimes he was an and, you were an or. Maybe he was an and, you were a but. Maybe there was one time you wanted ice cream, you wanted cake. What's one area that you differ from old Gums McGillicuddy in the White House? What's one day you differ from old Joseph R. Biden? Just, just, just one, just, just a smidgen, a smooch, just a, one thing. Kamala starts talking about nothing at all. Well, I, I, she sounds like Hillary Clinton. I, only Hillary Clinton could stay on point. She could still kind of say nothing, but throw out enough policy non sequiturs that it was stitched together to make a coherent point. When I said at the very beginning of this campaign, Kamala is Hillary Clinton, but worse, I did not mean Kamala was Hillary Clinton, but more liberal, although she is. I didn't mean Kamala Harris was Hillary Clinton, but more inept at campaigning, although she is. What I mean is Kamala Harris is just as bad at communicating to the American people, but she is far, far, far worse at saying anything of substance. That is just going to destroy her. That's going to destroy her. Donald Trump is out there every single day. Donald Trump, I guarantee you, over the next couple of weeks, when he's asked about the dogs and the cats thing, he'll probably laugh about it, say illegal immigration is really bad, and then that'll be it. And everyone will go, yeah, Donald Trump says stuff, you know, but the policies he's talking about are of serious concern to Americans. Immigration, the economy. Yep, that's top in the chart still. Kamala's out here talking about the child tax credit as though Republicans haven't been pushing expanded child tax credits for the last several decades. You know, the whole childless cat lady comment that Taylor Swift is whatever losing her genes about over on Instagram from J.D. Vance. The reason J.D. Vance was talking about that is because he thinks that Americans should be having lots of children and should be expanding the child tax credit. And by the way, if she would have said Joe Biden did not want to go as far for the middle class as I do. What is like, you're going to get back to the White House and Joe's going to scowl at you? <laughs> like when there's not enough okra left at the nursing home, so he's got to go with broccoli instead? Poor guy. No, who cares what he think? The dude's dead. Say what you want. But she can't because she has to try to get the last of the 90s labor Democratish kind of coalition y voters that kind of liked Biden a little bit while also trying to pull the far left progressives. Now, I made a very bold prediction at the end of the debate coverage. I haven't made it yet here on air, but it just wouldn't be quite fair without sharing it with you. Kamala Harris has lost Michigan. She has won Wisconsin. The races in those two states are pretty much over. Now, here's why I say that. In Wisconsin, which which Wisconsin has the largest per capita voting demographic of suburban women. More suburban women vote per capita in Wisconsin than any other Rust Belt state. Any other Rust Belt state. And really, any other swing state. I think they've actually passed Arizona as well. So, Kamala Harris playing really hard to abortion has pretty much won her Wisconsin. Kamala, during the debate, sided with Israel, although very awkwardly in a way that like convinced zero Jewish people. But, Kamala Harris did side with Israel. That has royally upset people in Michigan. And I said very clearly, the radical Islamists in favor of Shia Islam, not not Sunni Islam, but Shia Islam and pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian rhetoric, those people are going to be very upset. And that's what we've had. Several leaders now inside that part of Michigan have now completely denounced her and have made it all but a religious imperative to keep her out of office because they don't want to reward that kind of behavior, they say. So that's a sizable chunk she needs. She also hasn't done herself any favors with the union auto workers. She's tried to kind of gloss over the fact that she suggested that union auto workers, the UAW, as well as the Teamsters, were like all in favor, all just big, huge, happy-go-lucky fans of the super-duper, ultra-Harris, pooper-scooper plan for electric vehicles. They're not. They're not fans of it. So she didn't actually talk about issues that matter to black voters. She didn't talk about issues that matter to Hispanic voters, both of which are significant demographics in Michigan. She didn't really talk to union voters, and she really screwed over her radical Muslim base. No one in Michigan is left to vote for her. Suburban women are a lower per capita in Michigan because many of them went to Wisconsin when Detroit burned down. Numbers. Speaking of numbers, the Rasmussen, which is a right-leaning poll, the Rasmussen has Trump up now after the debate about six points. Now, I, I'm going to put a little bit of a little foot on the brake, just a little, just a smidgen, because, look, while I absolutely agree that I think Trump is probably going to go up in the polls, 
we do not yet have the data in from how people view the debates. So I think that it's more likely that Kamala is really not going to get much of a boost, but she will get a small boost in the national. And then Trump will probably end up going up a little bit as more Americans learn about Kamala. And that will happen naturally. The Taylor Swift nonsense, I'm sorry, I just don't buy it. Uh, the idea that like, oh, everyone's registering to vote. Yeah, well, they still have to go out and vote. We went through this last time. Taylor Swift came out. She endorsed Joe Biden in 2020. She registered all these voters and then nobody came out and voted. Because the youths find it annoying to go out and vote. It's like a trip to the DMV. Sorry. That, they, 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 I'm sorry. The, 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 the young youths are not going to come out and vote because Taylor Swift told them to. It ain't happening, Captain. She can release an entire song just about it's not happening. Sorry. That brings us to some really great news. And, and by the way, this is why I ended up coming back to finish the quick news roundup. Even though I was very rudely cut off the air by some leftist joker out there who was screwing around with the, the IP attack that I, quite honestly, I forgot to turn on my VPN. That one's on me. I'm going to be real with y'all. This is the real reason I had to come back and finish the segment. New. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which, by the way, has a 5-2 liberal majority has overturned a ruling from a lower court that originally had ruled in the last couple of weeks that it was illegal for Pennsylvania to throw out mail-in ballots that had the wrong date or no date on them. So what does that mean in more simple English without, out, you know, without the double negatives and all the other things? It means in Pennsylvania now it is legal for officials to throw out mail-in ballots that are not dated or not dated correctly. That is huge because that means voter fraud is much more difficult. If you take a mail-in ballot from someone's mailbox and you put the wrong date on it because you don't get it in time or you're not sending it that day out and you don't follow the right rules and directions, that does not count. That is an actual point, an actual hole in the security fence against voter fraud. Left, right, I don't care, whomever. Mail-in voting is not entirely secure. Can it be good sometimes? Sure. But in a situation in which you have a serious swing state, in which there is a state that has large inner city areas that have a history in the 20th century, especially in strong union areas like Chicago, like Detroit, like Gary, Indiana, like Toledo, like, you guessed it, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, which have histories of voter fraud in the 70s and the 80s, well, anything to shore up that type of voting procedure is a very, very good thing. That is a massive win for the country. And in this particular instance, it's a massive win for conservatives, though it was delivered by a liberal Supreme Court. Now, the reason I say it's a massive win for the country is because very strong elections that are difficult to tamper with, that's a win for everyone. Because if I run against someone on the left... And the left, the guy on the left is a better candidate than I am for whatever reason. You know, I'm in a coma or whatever. And more people choose to vote for him. And someone on my side cheats and I get more votes. The people are disenfranchised. That's wrong. The idea is that the people vote for the candidate they want. And then not only do they get the one they want, they suffer the consequences of whom they vote for. You vote for him, you got him. That's the idea of a constitutional republic. Whom you put in, you have to suffer under. And... That brings us to perhaps the most fatal flaw of the Harris-Walls campaign. They put all of their weight behind all of this DEI nonsense stuff with Kamala Harris and a very horrible pick by picking not Josh Shapiro because Josh Shapiro was a Jew from Pennsylvania. And instead of winning Pennsylvania, most likely, they threw Pennsylvania away pretty firmly at Donald Trump who caught it with a very nice catcher's mitt while they secured Minnesota and a guy with extremely disturbing stolen valor charges. That's the sugar high, by the way. After the media hype wears off and it all starts to fall apart, you realize you're still hungry. But it's too late. Candidates are already over. Conventions are already over. Names are on the ballot. It's done. It's set. It's locked. Mail-in ballots are going out. It's the Tony Kennett Cast on 93 WIBC.
Hey, hey, welcome back to the Tony Kinnett cast here on the Daily Signal, now nationally syndicated and first on 93 WIBC. We're thrilled to be joined again by the one, the only Andy No, whose work on exposing Antifa is just incredible. It's fearless and it has been acutely summarized, I would say, in his book, Unmasked. Uh, You definitely want to check this one out. This is one I was excited to add to the shelf. Let's just say that it is well worth your time. Andy, thanks for hopping on with us. Thanks for having me on. You know, actually, the book came out in 2021, but the reason why it seems new in the minds of many, and I appreciate that plug, is because, unfortunately, the topic is evergreen in the American Mm -hmm. political context. Well, it's definitely new to add to my shelf. I don't know why it wasn't on there already, but it is now. So uh, very, very well suited among some of my other recent favorites. So you have a new report coming out from Portland uh, that Antifa ringleader Alyssa Azar has been sentenced to jail by a county judge following a felony jury conviction last month. So, you know, not not just a little, little misdemeanor situation. First of all, can you go into detail about what she was sentenced for before we dig into the rest of the meat and potatoes of this situation? So the case is significant because Ms. Azar plays, according to prosecutor, a ringleader type role in in her involvement in a violent riot in June 2021 in Clackamas County, which is a neighboring moderate county to Multnomah County, where Portland is. I'm originally from Portland. Most of my reporting is about Portland. I was there on the ground during years of riots. And one thing that people who listen to me read my work know is that most of the time, in fact, almost always, the riot suspects are not held accountable. There's a number of reasons for that. There's the political culture of Portland. There's also the district attorney. There's also so on and so forth, I can go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just actors upon actors willing to go to bat for them or ignore their shenanigans. So this has created a culture where far left violent extremists feel like they can engage in acts of criminality, violent criminality, arson attacks, assault with impunity. And unfortunately, usually they can do those acts with impunity. But in June of 2021, Alyssa Azar and her comrades dressed in black went to Clackamas County and engage in a violent brawl with associated Proud Boys members and other people that they accused of being far right. Um, people in the park were victimized. This is a summer day where people ha- brought their children and families right. to the park and they were subjected to this barrage of pepper spray um, during the trial that happened the five-day trial that happened in, in August, my, my my great colleague, Katie Davis Court, was there throughout the entire trial. Touch to the dismay of the Antifa individuals who I think tried to get the post-millennial crew thrown out because uh, simply covering the event, was, what did they say, inciting violence towards the violent provocateur? Repeatedly. So th- th- you violent. bring up another issue. I'll get to that in just a sec. Just Sorry, to- I can't. This whole situation is just bonkers. To to sum up the case, law enforcement testimony provided from Oregon City Police said that there were they recovered explosive devices there. Mm-hmm. So really serious stuff. It's not just yeah. people going to a park and fighting. There were Alyssa Azar was indicted a number of years ago. There have been other Proud Boy members so alleged who have been indicted as well, and they have their cases pending. So the significance of Miss Azar's case is that she she's has a very large social media following. She's become, in my view, the chief propagandist for Antifa in the Portland area. I think that's accurate. And the fact that, to my knowledge, she remains the first and the only Antifa member in the entire state of Oregon who has been convicted at trial. So I'll repeat that. Nobody else in all these other years of rioting, thousands of cases by now, None of them have been convicted at trial. The few that were convicted in Portland for very serious crimes like attempted murder and Mm -hmm. other serious assaults, they took sweetheart plea deals, usually did not do prison time. And so this case has angered Antifa in the Pacific Northwest because they felt like they've been able to do their crimes with impunity. Azar burst into tears when the verdict was read out. By the way, the jury was made up of mostly women and the defense had a number of tactics that were trying to argue that she's a journalist. She's not. 
um, that she was engaging in self-defense. She wasn't. They tried to argue that she's a helpless um, small woman who was attacked by violent far-right men. The jury of females in Oregon did not buy it, and they convicted her. So I do want to actually make sure that if you're watching the live stream on X or YouTube, you actually get a look at this. Those who are on the podcast, here's what it sounds like. Check this out. The trial was last month in August and sentencing finally happened last week. Unfortunately, in the state of Oregon, it's a state run by Democrats and the legislation that they passed over the years um, has moved in the direction where criminal, criminal convicts are not serving much time, if at all, in oh, prison what a surprise. when they're convicted. So the most that Ms. Azar was looking at, the maximum she was looking at, was 30 days in a local jail, not prison, local jail. And that's what the prosecutors asked for in addition to probation. They also asked for GPS monitoring. Her defense, she and she's been represented pro bono as far as I know by a far left activist attorney, part of a really radical far left group called the Civil Liberties Defense Center. What a name, a mm -hmm. misleading name. They represent violent Antifa suspects. And the defense argued that she shouldn't serve any time in jail and that putting her, sending her to jail is racist, sexist, you know, all these type of buzzwords. Uh, the judge didn't buy much of what the defense was saying. The, the defense also tried to get my colleague, um, Katie Davis Corr, and our photographer, Shelly, Shelly Bufarash, thrown out of the court, alleging that our reporting had incited death threats against Azar and her family. I love so, the idea of throwing out the, the photographer as well, as though like the pictures taken themselves are somehow going to be used to incite death threats or whatever. It just, I, I'm glad the judge threw that nonsense out because the post-millennial crew has just an excellent staff, as you've already said, as of which you work with consistently, an excellent staff of both reporters and photographers. Well, there's a, it's part of the MO to try to kick press out, particularly press who are reporting honestly about these trials that involve Antifa members, because yep. a lot of the evidence will go under the radar at trial. And in addition, you don't, the public won't get, get the true understanding that so much of their activities and organizing is masked behind secrecy. And literally you could see that in that the dozens of people who came to support Azar both at the trial and at the sentencing were wearing masks, sunglasses, head coverings. And unfortunately that's allowed because of um, changes from the pandemic that allow mm -hmm. people to hide their identities even in a, in a courtroom setting. And so Azar was sentenced to just 14 days in jail, the, the judge gave about half of what the prosecution was asking for. And she won't even serve the full 14 days. Um, she's scheduled to be, re be released after 11, and it's likely she'll probably be released earlier than that. That's um, just insane. Uh, but in, in Oregon, this is really the most uh, uh, punishment that a uh, Antifa member can really face. Unfortunately for Ms. Azar, and maybe fortunately for the rule of law, this is not the end of her legal woes. In that, in Multnomah County, in May, she was arrested um, at a pretty violent Portland state occupation when there were these encampments going on for Gaza. So that An Antifa case, occupation getting violent? No, come yeah, now! What a surprise! <laughs> exactly. So that criminal case is still ongoing for her in Multnomah County. And now that she's a, con a convicted felon, any future convictions, her sen the sentencing guidelines for that is, will be different. It will be more severe. To catch the rest of this interview and Andy's conversation with me about leadership structures in Antifa and how this plays out in other states, you'll have to head over to the Daily Signal's YouTube We'll be back in just a second. This is the Tony Kennett cast on The Daily Signal, nationally syndicated first on 93 WIBC. It's the Tony Kennett cast on 93 WIBC. Just a curbside profit with my hand in my pocket. So, 
I look, I, I'm going to level with you guys just a little bit if we can actually keep the network up for a few minutes. Uh, someone was trying to get just a it looks like a little bit uh, a little bit cuddly with our um, our Internet access. And so uh, we've hopefully righted that and uh, back on the air. Just a, a few quick things to point out, though. I usually really don't care for kind of like political movies. Um, and I really don't care for a lot of movies that come from uh, like, uh, let's say like pointed advocacy standpoints. I really don't care for a lot of like Christian studio movies because they're not as good as, as like regular kind of like Hollywood movies. The story may be great. The heart may be there. It might even be okay. Like you watch the feed and you're like, yeah, okay. And then you never really ever watch it again because it was like, ah, it was good, but not good enough to watch again. I think that if you're going to make a good movie, it needs to be able to be watched again. And I found myself in that particular situation this week when I was flying down to Nashville. So the Daily Wire has been making a really big deal over the last couple of months about this documentary by Matt Walsh, uh, this mockumentary, excuse me, called Am I Racist, in which Matt Walsh dresses up in a disguise, which is literally a, an illy fitting wig and with a man bun, and then goes around pretending to be a diversity, equity, and inclusion, a DEI expert, and um, basically gets all of these critical race theorists to say the quiet part out loud. Uh, the kind of stuff that some of those out here, like us, who had, had uh, basically been whistleblowing this kind of junk back in the uh, 2020 and 2021, that we've been saying has been going on. Everyone said, no, no one ever actually says that behind closed doors. Well, Walsh went actually to go and prove it. And uh, so I'd been sent the screener, and uh, which is just a little preview. Sometimes it's like a two-thirds cut. Sometimes it's a full cut of the movie, just in case I thought maybe it was newsworthy and worthy of a segment. And I said, well, you know, I've, I've covered Walsh's judged show earlier this year, so probably won't do an article on it, but I'll, I'll watch it because, you know, it's kind of connecting to my career. So I uh, ended up watching it, and it was one of the funniest things I have seen in a very, very long time. The last time I think that I actually saw something that was this funny, I think it was probably close to Napoleon Dynamite, just in how sheerly nuts some of this stuff was that was going on in this mockumentary. It definitely gave off some office vibes at times, only this was with real people. And... Um, then I was invited down for the premiere, so drew, uh, flew down to Nashville on Monday, finished watching the screener, and uh, did a couple of interviews with some people on the red carpet, or for them, the, the, the black carpet, nice, uh, as they were going into the movie. And then I watched the movie again, and I really wasn't looking forward to it because I thought, well, you know, uh, I don't like really watching these kind of movies over again. I had an absolute blast. This is a movie to see in theaters. There are very few times when I tell you, you need to go and see something. Go to Am I Racist, find tickets at your local theater. There are like 1,500 theaters all around the country because it is a phenomenal, phenomenal movie, especially with a packed theater. You'll be laughing. It is a great, great movie. And it really, it really is just the funniest nonsense. I recognize some of the people in the movie. That's all I'm, I'm going to say at this particular point in time. Uh, but this brings together an interesting light, and these are some of the questions that I tried to ask those on the, the red carpet, or the black carpet, or whatever, at the premiere. Um, the first that I really wanted to get the best answer on is, how do you balance doing a comedy and a documentary? Because this is both. Because if you go too far, you get really cringy and it gets kind of rough. So I started out by asking um, Ben Shapiro uh, just what it was specifically that you had to do in order to make this work. Here was my question, his answer. Dealing with comedy and satire, it's kind of a fine balance, right? Because you've got like Upton Sinclair and like exposing the gross stuff in the 20s and then it kind of took a harsher tint later on. How are you guys bridging the gap between making entertainment that's good and kind of cringy that still has substance. Well, I mean, honestly, all props to Matt and to Justin Folk and to all the people who worked on the film because it is a really, really difficult task. I mean, you mentioned sort of muckrakers of the past and everything that they did was very serious and gritty. Yeah. And the truth is that society has become so serious and gritty. Everybody is so sort of depressed that making people laugh at a thing is a quality that we've lost over time. And it's a really important quality because sometimes it's really important just to be able to look at a dumb thing, expose it for being a dumb thing, and then laugh at the thing. I mean, even the comedies on SNL, everyone's like, their shoulders are all tense. Exactly. It's so exactly. weird. No one, no one laughs at anything. 
anymore. Making jokes, everybody has to think three times about making the joke. So being able to actually just say, listen, this is stupid. And I'm not even going to say it's stupid, what, which is what Matt said. I'm not even going to say it's dumb. I'm going to sit here, and you're just going to watch this person. And you're going to realize how stupid this is. And they're going to expose themselves. It's an amazing thing. And listen, Matt does something really audacious in the film, which is he actually acts, which is which is an amazing thing. Um, you know, again, I something I couldn't do. He, he has a skill set. I don't know anybody else in the movement who has it. And uh, he deserves every, every piece of credit he gets, for sure. So uh, I also got the same kind of a response, uh, actually from the uh, actor Kirk Cameron, and and kind of a same response, but kind of a different perspective on on the answer here. Comedy, right? Take a documentary and tackle a totally difficult subject like DEI, and expect not to get shot on the way out from the theater to the parking lot. Very serious question, of course. Well. I would have said I have great security, you know, like Secret Service, but uh, even that has its has its uh, chinks in the armor. Too many sloped roofs around Too here. Too many sloped roofs. But at, at the end of the day, I think that we're going to see the way that you tackle a topic like DEI with humor and do it effectively with class, with fidelity to the truth, and use comedy and satire in a way that is not obnoxious and arrogant, because some some are are, are brash with it and and, and, and it's off putting. But I think we're going to see how it, how it's done tonight with Matt Walsh's movie. Am I a racist? So really good take. I, I appreciated you know kind of the ideas behind it, and that drove me to really asking a question from the Daily Wire CEO Jeremy Boring. They're doing a lot of stuff down there right now in Nashville. They're they're doing a, a razor manufacturing company. They are are selling chocolate. Uh, they're selling candles. They're doing several different kinds of shows. They're doing documentaries. They're doing children's content. They're doing like full live action shows about about dragons and all other kinds of crazy stuff. It's a lot on their plate, a lot. And so I've wanted to ask this question to Jeremy Boring for a heck of a long time, and I um. Well, I, I wasn't going to let a uh, premiere of something totally different get in the way from that. So here is the answer. How on God's green earth do you do all of this stuff and do it well? As a business guy, you're hitting on a lot of fronts all at the same time, right? You're doing the, the own business ventures, right? You're tackling the media industry, kids stuff, comedy stuff, serious stuff. How do you balance making really good content with also making content that keeps all of your people employed? I mean, obviously, if you build it, they'll come, but sorry if that's not as worded as freshly as it could be. No, it's a great question. And I actually think that it isn't true that if you build it, they will come. I think that's like proof of the power of culture is that we all say that because of a movie. But in my business experience, what I've come to realize is it's not enough to build it. You have to build it well. And it's not enough to build it well. You have to build it well and then tell people about it. And so part of our vision when we started The Daily Wire was let's create a marketing machine that's capable of taking our content, capable of taking our ideas and actually getting people to engage with it. Being able to bypass all the middlemen who historically would have prevented us from getting those messages out there, from getting that content out there, from getting those products out there. So it's all a marketing game. And, and that seems to have worked so far. Now, there's a lot of uh, other great moments from the premiere, and we'll be releasing a video soon that kind of goes more in depth. Of course, The Daily Wire has amassed a large pool of talent. Of course, their their com comedy trio from uh, Lady Ballers was there. Um, I did notice that they were dressed kind of like um, the, the Saturday Night Live sketch night at the Roxbury. So, you know, pointing that out was a very important part of my work. So wait a minute, can I get all three of you? Oh, at the same time. I will give you 50 bucks right now if we can do the night at the Roxbury. Oh, like. I've, I've never been more proud of the three of you than I am right now. I know. So we'll, we'll dig into that in another video. But one thing I did want to share with you guys before we cut and go to the next segment uh, is Matt Walsh. Uh, a lot of people ask questions, you know, why did you do this? Did you think it was funny? I, however, have worked with some of the goobers in this movie. I don't mean those exposing the junk. They're not goobers. Those who are peddling the kind of racial garbage that white people are inherently evil and people with different skin colors are inherently virtuous and that everything is systemically terrible, all that garbage. What I wanted to know was he was able to get Robin D'Angelo and many other really terrible people on camera for interviews and got them to say stupid things. I wanted to know what's the one that got away. Cause I had people that I wanted to see on screen that didn't there's, you know, only so many, so little time. 
Here's the one that got away, and uh, I, I cackled in the idea of thinking about this one. Who was the one that got away on this project? I know there are a lot of grifters out there you could have gotten. Was the one that was like right on the hook, that was so close? Please tell me it was Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings. I don't know about, I mean, we, look, we uh, named the grifter and we tried to get them, uh, but they're, they're kind of hard to get. You know, we, we went after Ibram X. Kendi, but he's hard to, he's very cautious. The one that was close, just like almost had him? I don't know if I want to, I mean, we, we did try Kaepernick. Uh, no. Yeah. Are you serious? I don't know. We got, we got, we got, you know, we got part, we were, we were in conversation and that would have been great. Because wow. I really, you know, what I really wanted to do with that scene was just comfort him uh, for, for everything he's gone through, being a multimillionaire. Give him a pack of knee pads or something or? Just, just, I just wanted to be there for him in this difficult time of being a millionaire or celebrity. Are we all? Uh, yeah. You really need to go see this. Seriously, I will probably be going to see it again with some friends and family. Uh, it really is worth watching a couple of times. I have not been able to say this about a movie, much less a political movie, in an extremely long time. Go see this one. The Reagan movie's good. I'll get around to seeing it eventually. I've heard really good things. Go see Am I Racist by Matt Walsh. And by the way, it's selling out in theaters now. That's how good it is. And really, it is. it's fantastic. I've watched it twice. I'm going to watch it again, likely this weekend, uh, because I'm, I'm mad that I can't quote this garbage to my wife. That's another thing. It's been a long time since millennials have had something to quote. You know what I'm talking about. You know, that you'd go to school the next day and you'd have the movie quotes you all would repeat over and over and over again. This is one of those movies. Go see it. It's fantastic. We'll have a lot more on our, our red carpet interviews uh, a little bit later. By the way, I've never done red carpet interviews before. Uh, so if I seemed out of my element, I absolutely was. Um, I'm still figuring out how you do the microphone canceling out the voices in a loud room. That's right. You thought I was perfect? Ha, fooled you. I'm still figuring this crap out. And that means up next, it's time for a little bit of mail time because we've got some questions. We're going to answer them. Stick around. It's the Tony Kennett cast on The Daily Signal, nationally syndicated and first on 93 WIBC. You're listening to the Tony Kennett Cast on 93 WIBC. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Tony Kennett Cast on 93 WIBC. It's good to be with you because it is time for just a little bit of mail time. Mail time. Mail time. Mail time. So, my first question for this is evening is a uh this is from a guy named ricky and uh, i i like this question a lot so he who i'm flattered to know that he actually watches the show enough to ask a kind of prolonged question he says why are you in the process of building a studio at the moment uh why not just go and do the show at uh wibc in indianapolis so for those who are in our syndicated partners around the country i live east of indianapolis and i hate i hate hate the city. I hate cities so much. I do not like them at all. In fact, when I started the show, um, my focus was not on the inside of 465, the interstate that surrounds Indianapolis, like a lot of the other shows do. A lot of the uh, shows on that station focus on kind of the central Indianapolis and surrounding county areas. I try to focus on the outside of that and the nation at large, for, for one, because I find that just a bit more interesting. And number two, because I love the good old Hoosier rural and sub-rural soil. It is my favorite thing on earth. So much so that back home again in Indiana is one of my daughter's favorite lullabies. Very proud moment for me as a parent. I hate driving into the city. I don't care for it. I also like being at home with my uh, wife and kids just in the other room. Um, or pretty soon just out at the studio, I'll be able to walk right in and see them. I like being able to tuck my kids into bed uh, because... Um, that's just really important. Not that that's not important to a lot of other people. I would just prefer to do that. Number three, uh, the honest reason is that the studio room that I'm currently doing this in is just a bit too small. I'm not going to show kind of what that looks like right now, at least <laughs> on the air. But it's a it's a rather small room that we have set up and I just kind of have outgrown it. There are some special guests that really want to come on the show, but want to come in in person. 
And uh, well, we need a studio that's big enough in order to do that. So we'll be talking about some of the partners that have helped us build that soon. Um, there are so many great people out there. Nate Byers, uh, Concrete, John Bundy from Rightway Property. Um, they've been doing some phenomenal stuff. We'll get to all of that soon, I promise. Uh, the next question is a, a food question. It actually comes today. Uh, so why do I refer to the Kamala Harris campaign as the sugar high and cotton candy? Cotton candy is all sugar, no substance. It's all of the sugar you could possibly want. It's sweet. It might be exciting. It might even look really good in the bag. And as soon as you eat it as an adult, you're like, why did I eat this? And it's kind of gross. Cotton candy is never really as good as it looks in the bag. And that's Kamala Harris campaign. There's the sugar high, right? It's, it's the drinking an entire Mountain Dew or drinking a monster or an energy drink of some kind. And then you're wired. And for a few minutes, it's like, yeah, let's go. There was like momentum when she launched her campaign. Yeah, we're making up the ground that Joe Biden lost. And then when people realize there's no substance, uh, you realize cotton candy is not a snack. It's not filling. There's nothing to it. Donald Trump's campaign right now is like a TV dinner. It fills you up. Now, is it the best thing in the world? No, it's not. Do I like a good TV dinner every once in a while? Absolutely. Do I know what I'm getting with a TV dinner? Absolutely. I have had this Marie Callender's chicken pot pie a lot in my life, and I will gladly have it again. I absolutely will enjoy this. That's the Trump campaign. It's filling. Is it the best thing? Is there stuff that I wish that was different? Sure. But if I'm going to choose a dinner between a plate of cotton candy and a pretty decent TV dinner, I'm going to choose the TV dinner. Because one of those is going to fill me up and give me at least enough of the nutrients that I need. So uh, that is my kind of analogy. I think in a lot of food analogies because, you know, food is delicious. Um, really bold, amazing, intelligent statements only on this show. Uh, the last question for the evening um, said, uh, do you know that sometimes the show, this actually came during the debate, so I thought it was really appropriate, especially after tonight. How do you work to get past so he first said do you know you have a lot of technical issues on the show from time to time and then says uh how do you work to get through those the long and short of it is i don't think many have really tried doing a show like this yet one that is simulcasted on radio on tv up in milwaukee on live streaming services um with producers in four or five locations you've got producer allison over in indianapolis producer lou is over in pennsylvania you've got those in washington dc and all of these moving parts, you know, the, sometimes the moving parts don't mesh and groove in the way that you work. Instead of, you know, shilling out for a really big, massive group that's going to force me to say things that I really don't want to say, uh, that might perhaps step on the toes of what I want to say on the show, we do it this way. And then we try to work through different uh, problems that we encounter as soon as we can. Uh, again, I've always been under the impression that when I was a teacher, my students could smell fake the minute I was almost a little bit kind of fake. So I, I tried never to be fake. And I try to do the same with y'all. Uh, it may not always be perfect. It may not be the most polished thing ever. It may not be the podcast you listen to every day, but that's all right. So this one's actually from Jerry Lopez, which cracks me up that he's tuning in and listening to this. Thank you for guest hosting while I was gone, by the way. He says, what do we do now with the immigrants that are here from other countries that will not accept them? Here is the answer. If they are legal immigrants, if they have come legally, as in they have sought asylum at a port of entry with a good reason, or they have gone through the legal immigration process and come into the country, welcome them and assimilate them. Welcome them into the country because they have immigrated legally. Teach them our customs and our ways. Welcome them. Get them through the awkward stage of feeling like a foreigner. Make them feel at home. They're no longer a French American or a Haitian American or a Venezuelan American. They're an American. When they have legally immigrated, and they have gone through the test of learning all of our practices and policies on their way to getting citizenship, they should be welcomed and encouraged. It's how a lot of my family got here. It's how a lot of your family likely got here. That's a good thing. Assimilation and welcoming for legal immigrants. If it's an illegal immigrant, get out of here. I don't know where I'm supposed to do go. I, I, okay. It, un, again, unless you have a very, very good reason that you did not go to a port of entry on the southern border and take a piece of paper and get in line. Like, if you're telling me the cartel has been chasing you, like a movie, all the way up from Venezuela, through Central America, up to the border, so that you didn't have time, because there was a car on your left and a car on your right, all you could go was straight at the border. 
Unless you have a reason like that, I'm sorry, you're gone. You did not emigrate legally. There are people in line. There are people from your country. I guarantee it. At last time I checked on the waiting list right now, we have people from every country on earth, except for the Isle of Man, who are trying to get into this country. Yes, even uh, some of the smaller European nations. I just found that out a little bit earlier. You know, Malta is actually, there's somebody that's waiting uh, on the legal immigration process. So unless you're from uh, some of the, you know, kind of extra micro kind of goofy stuff, every country's got people waiting in line. Why not you? You're not special. Boot them out. You say, well, where would we boot them to? Back where they came from. And they say, well, Mexico wouldn't like it if we just tossed them back over the border. I bet they won't. Maybe Mexico shouldn't have allowed them to walk through their country and harm people on our side of the border because that's the catch. Allowing people through your country in order to harm citizens on the other side, as we see with a lot of Venezuelan gangs, for an instance, that is an act of war. It threatens neutrality. It does. It threat guys, you guys, the entire first and second world wars were fought to cement this. Germany was not allowed to march through Belgium because that is an act of war. You cannot allow Belgium cannot just like let Germany, hey, you guys go right on ahead. That's not a thing you can do. That means you are now an accessory to war. It's aiding and abetting. Basic civics, boys and girls, here with Tony Kennett on a Friday night. I think, unless there are any other particularly interesting um, questions, uh, I'm going to make sure that there aren't right before we swing back for the end of the show. All right, you know what? I'll take it. It's been wonderful being with you this week. I know it's been kind of crazy and it's been kind of hectic. It is an absolute joy to join you guys to be on the air, uh, and we'll be back next week hopefully to share some progress on the studio and some other great projects we have in the works. This has been the Tony Kinnett cast on The Daily Signal, nationally syndicated, and on all of our radio and TV syndicated partners. Take care. <laughs>